Welcome to This Commerce Life. We are an unscripted podcast dedicated to small businesses and entrepreneurs in the retail and consumer packaged goods space in Canada and the United States. I'm Phil Chang, co-host and co-founder. And I'm Kenny Benici, co-host and co-founder of This Commerce Life. Our love is the journey to retail, and our passion is sharing that with you every week. We got everybody? Good morning. Good morning. Good Jimmy. morning. How are, you? How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. We're good. We're good. That's good. I got, I'm going to tackle this one alone solo. Okay. Yeah, you got it. That's all right with you guys. Totally. Are you ready? Are yeah. you ready for it? Like I'm ready. Buckle ready. up, baby. Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> usually it's baseball. usually usually the guest gives us more trouble than we give the guests so i'm more worried about us than you oh it's perfect <clears throat> no we love it we love it it's uh it's funny because we met you gosh it seems like a long time ago like may right chfa was may mm-hmm. or something in there and now it's august we're on the cusp of chfa east um but um it's just been one of those summers, right? So, absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. So we're we're glad to get you on. We're excited to. Both of us are coffee guys as well. We love coffee. Perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. totally love coffee. Yeah, I was wondering. I'm like, man, these guys must be banging out podcasts left, right, and center all summer. <laughs> we we have been we've been on a tear. So we we probably at one point. Um, we had we had a lot of guests so so at one point we were we were recording like kind of like two to three a week and then like over the summer um we we kind of put out like an extra episode every other thursday um because we were hearing you know like like some some podcasts take the break over the summer and so um we're just not big enough to take a break (laughs) Yeah, there's no breaks. Time to, time to, time yeah. to double down. Yeah, we, we stopped talking. I think people have stopped listening. So, um, so yeah, so we started putting out one every other Thursday as well. Plus, so, we had to yeah. get ahead. We had to book way ahead because yeah. he was gone a week. Yeah. I was gone three weeks. Yeah. And we were both yeah. in Europe. And, you know, Wi-Fi can be, Funky. you know, dicey on a good day. Yeah. And, you know, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So we've tried to get our shit together, get a little bit ahead of ourselves. How bit. that worked, I don't bit. know. I mean, it seemed to have worked. We'll so. see. We'll, we'll see. see. Jamie, we where are you based see. out of? You're I'm based Cal- out of uh, I'm based out of Calgary, Alberta. Out of Calgary. Yeah, I'm actually I live uh, I live actually on a ranch just outside of Calgary. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, so nice. that's why so I'm north of, super old. North of the city, <laughs> south of the city. Like which way you go toward Edmonton or toward uh, towards uh, <laughs> Turner Valley? Okay. Yeah, so wh- I'm actually west of Turner Valley. I'm pretty much okay. as far west as you can go before you hit Crown Land. Or you run into the crown land and the mountains yes yeah how cool yeah. is that that's oh, a, pretty is this cool. a family thing or something that uh... uh no it's it's actually just been a long-term goal of uh my partner and i's for for a long time and and we were finally able to make it become a reality in 2019 yeah. wow. good for you fantastic yeah. so you bought wow. uh, like a ranch ranch like acreage, acreage? It's, well it's not like honestly it this sounds ridiculous it's 40 acres which is lots of acreage um but it's not it's not like yellowstone where we have over a thousand acres and buddy i live on a 33 by 140 in (laughs) vancouver so 40 acres is yellowstone your your place is probably more expensive (laughs) than mine (laughs) Uh, potentially i mean it it is vancouver but i'd much rather have yours than that than this one but the land is good 40 acres to me like 40 acres is like that's that is yellowstone yeah, yeah call, it like, is. that's it i mean that's huge yeah yeah it's, it's quite it's quite big and and that's uh, awesome um, yeah it's beautiful so it's right in the foothills and we get elk and grizzly bears and everything out here that's, that's fantastic time. and, and so you uh, do you live in yellowstone that's, <laughs> I, I it. it sounds yeah, exactly sure like will, it to me i'm sure you guys will find out more about me as the podcast rolls on and and uh um the reason we kind of moved out here was Ultimately, I'm just, I have that entrepreneur mindset and uh, my, my, um, my fiance at the time, she, she had two horses and we were paying about mortgage payment a month, trying to board and stable them when we lived in the city. Sure. And I was like, I grew up on a farm, uh, ultimately kind of out East in, in, in New Brunswick. My dad has mm. one out there. So okay. really, I, I was like, why are we spending all of this money? 
when we can vertically integrate, bring them home, you'll be close to them. I'll have my space. We'll both be happy. That's like a great it. thing. Good for you. I like it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's good thinking. <clears throat> yeah. Um, let's do a quick intro so everyone knows who we're talking about. So we are talking to Jamie Parker. Um, he is with Calgary Heritage Roasting. Uh, and naturally, we uh, were get, Kenny and I are both attracted to the business. One, because you make great coffee. And then two is such an interesting story. And, and uh, we asked Jamie to come on the show. And um, yeah, so we're here. And, and uh, I think this episode will actually go out before a CHFA, which will be amazing. Be kind of um, cool. So people are you doing have, east? have you top of mind. Um, are you coming out east? Be doing east? No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, we okay. kind of pick and choose. It just depends on yeah. how we're looking. Ultimately, our, our company, our kind of trajectory is to hit more of the, the western side, just at yeah. current pace. Makes sense. Yeah. Not Walk up your own neighborhood first, for sure. That's that's sure. it, yeah. Okay. But well, you can talk about that as we go forward. I was yeah, just curious yeah. to see if you're going to yeah, see yeah. or not. So, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're... If you're going to be as if you're listening to this, you got to go to the website, which we'll put the the episode notes so you can get your coffee straight from them. But uh, um, so I've done the intro, Jamie. Let's uh, we're going to turn Show's this yours, over man. to you. Tell us tell us about you and <clears throat> what's going on with you and where where you came from, all that stuff. Yeah, totally. Um, do you want more of, of where I came from and then and then the company or just kind I'd of? I'd love to because yeah, yeah. I like to. I for me yeah. like. <laughs> Sometimes we're bad because you know, we love our listeners, but usually it's a Phil and I show. I love the, the the lines. I like to connect the dots and understand how someone goes from, you know, where they were to where they are. I loved it. I love that story. So yeah. light yeah. it up from New Brunswick, I'm assuming, as you said, on. Yeah. Well, my dad was, uh, so my dad was in the military um, and I kind of grew up a little bit of a military kid uh, in Canada here. He was stationed in Manitoba, Shiloh at the time, and yeah. I was born in Brandon, Manitoba. Um, then we kind of bounced around a little bit from there and, and ended up in Calgary. And that's kind of why I ended up in Calgary. Uh, when I was really young, my parents actually split up and my dad got stationed back out east um, in Kingston. Um, and then I wouldn't call Kingston ultimately east, but East enough, east of Calgary. Uh, right. And then I, my mom and, and us, we stayed in Calgary. So ultimately, like I grew up in Calgary and um, my dad, he kind of bumped around just to, from, from base to base, wherever he was, he was located or restationed. And then he ended up back in Gagetown um, where he was, he was training a bunch of, I'm not exactly sure what he was doing but he was he was training other other uh military personnel out there and and he had uh bought a farm uh he comes from a long long line of of farmers out there they've like he has five brothers and they all own potato farms um down down in new brunswick there wow. by perth andover so uh what kind of happened in my life is i was able to grow up in the city of calgary um but i would fly home all summer um, I call it home. I call them both home. Uh, I would fly home to New Brunswick all summer and I would help farm and hay and, and hang out with all of my cousins and pretty much have the best time of my life and then come back to school and play sports and, and do everything. Um, yeah, I didn't, I think I was like an average run of the mill mill kid, but, uh, I do remember now that I'm older, I remember some very key points in, in kind of realizing that I was going to be an entrepreneur if only I knew it back then then I could have acted on it sooner but um yeah my brother was a big influence on on that for me he always made me get get outside and and uh, my older brother Ryan he'd always make me build stuff or we would go down to the Safeway and we would ask people if they needed help taking their carts back to their car so we could get the quarter after every time. And we would, we would take all that money. We'd go and buy a couple toys or buy some whatever. Um, and we, we were constantly <laughs> doing uh, little things like that. Any, any way to make a buck. Uh, we didn't grow up in like extremely rich families by any means. And, and so my brother and I kind of had to fend for ourselves and we had a lot of very creative ways we were those kids that were always out shoveling people's snow, uh, snow off their driveways for right. $5. And now that I'm older, I'm like, wow, that was not a good business. Cheap labor. Cheap labor. <laughs> $5 yeah. to Cheap shovel labor. off a massive snow pad. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, as, as time progressed, um, 
I always kept those 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 money making uh, small business ideas kind of kind of rolling. And that's just I, uh, I, I think when you're a kid, the cost benefit not to like geek out on it, but <laughs> the cost benefit analysis is a driveway is just fine for five bucks, right? You what what else were you gonna do? What else were you gonna you're do? You're probably gonna break oh, something inside, get in crap, and then <laughs> right. have to sit well, in the corner, right? So you were outside shoveling the driveway, getting muscles. It's all good, right? But what do you mean? You know, no, who looked at it that way? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. an hour. Like it was, yeah, what was, yeah, a, yeah, what was yeah, an hour yeah. worth? Or a couple hours, right? Yeah. And yeah. you're also kind of hanging out with your buddies <laughs> and everybody would just scatter. Yeah. So it was exactly. And you're making yeah. money. So, yeah. and that was the whole oh, thing. Like, you know, you're making five bucks, five yeah. bucks, five bucks. But when cool. you get to like, when you're 20 and then you're like, yeah, that was it. stupid. Five bucks. Like, Listen, it's not going to like cover the pizza I need to be able to eat. <laughs> yeah, that was when right? $5 so, yeah. was worth $5 as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It's true. It's exactly. True. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. Yeah. So that's kind of kind of how I, I grew up. I went to, went to high school in, in Calgary, Alberta. And then I was uh, actually right after high school, I was fortunate enough. <clears throat> Um, I actually, I was actually a little bit of a bigger kid in high school and, uh, towards the end, I, I worked my way to, to getting rid of all that weight and, and I was playing sports and, um, graduated high school in Calgary. Then I, uh, worked full time. I actually have, I've worked, man, I would say I probably had over 40 jobs and I've never been fired from any of them. Um, I, I just always had this, this need to to jump onto something new, kind of expend myself there, gain as much as I can. And then I got bored and I would have to kind of move on onto the next best thing. And at a high school, I actually used to work for, uh, it was like a utility construction company. So I installed coax cable, uh, gas pipeline, uh, fiberglass, all that, all that kind of, or yeah, fiber optics, sorry, all that kind of stuff for telecommunications um, across Alberta and, and up into the Northwest territory. So I did some of that for a while. And then, um, my buddies finally bugged me enough. And I saw that they're in university that, uh, it seemed like it, it was something I couldn't miss. So I finally decided to go to university. So I went, uh, to the university of, of Calgary. And I also went to, um, Mount Royal university as well. I actually did a, a, a a two-year transfer from Mount Royal into the U of C. Um, and then I finished uh, up my university career with uh, a bachelor of, what do I have? A bachelor of science majoring in kinesiology. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For you, that's a little diverse. Yeah. A lot of shit going on there. Yeah. So uh, that was kind of like my university career. And then, um, which kind of segues me a little bit into um, coming around to how I started our company. Um, I remember I was at the very end of my my university career, and I was thinking a lot about what the hell am I going to do with my my degree that seems to <laughs> go nowhere. It seemed um, like it was a useful thing to study, and yeah, then you oh man, it seemed know. like it was a useful thing to study, and <laughs> and I thought yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought I was actually going to go into medicine, but uh, I worked mm-hmm. at the Children's Hospital for a few years, and it just seemed like it wasn't for me. So um, I was kind of kind of in this this weird transition spot that I think a lot of uh, mid 20 year olds go through. And, and uh, at the time I had heard from, I'd heard from a buddy of mine actually in the, the men's locker room that, uh, that you could get paid for the summer to jump out of helicopters and fight wildfires. And I had thought about that and I thought, wow, that, that sounds pretty amazing. Um, and so uh, I was a little bit late that year to actually apply and my buddy had applied for it and uh, he we I trained trained with him and and got him fit enough to kind of uh, be successful throughout the camp and and the next year after I saw what he had done I was I was all in um, so it was pretty incredible there's there's quite a few applicants for the Alberta wildfire repel program and I think there's over a thousand applicants and then they kind of take you down from there and and they actually end up only selecting about 25 20 to 25 people to send to their training camp wow okay really competitive yeah Yeah, and and it's very paramilitary (laughs) very paramilitaristic so uh the camp is uh for a month long you wake up for the first two weeks you actually go earlier than everybody else there's there's kind of multiple divisions in wildfire there's hell attack and there's unit crew and all of that and 
Uh, rappel has to go a little bit earlier because you have to learn how to rappel out of a helicopter. So we would go two weeks early and I didn't realize what I was in for, but you wake up at about every, every day, 5.30 a.m. and you go for uh, anywhere between a 15, 20 kilometer run. And then you get back, you have breakfast, you suit up and you run this 100 foot tower every morning um, where you there's I forget exactly how many stairs there are. I think there's 136 stairs. You start to you count them at the end of the day. Anyways, you go up this tower. Uh, they teach you how to repel out of it. And every time you make a mistake, you have to unsuit and you have to do t- about 10 burpees or 10 push ups or 10 chin ups. You suit back up, you go back up, you make another mistake, you do the same thing. Uh, you pretty much do this day in and day out for, for 20 days uh, until you learn how to repel or you injure yourself or you get rolled out because you're, you're not, uh, you can't do it. You just, you can't do it or you're not advancing yeah. or you don't have enough heart. Um, and I was successfully, uh, one of the nine people that be picked for that season wow. uh, out of 25. Wow. wow. So then I, uh, I worked as a wildland, uh, repel firefighter for the next four years, um, with the government of Alberta best time of my life, probably best job I've ever had in my life, aside from being an entrepreneur. Um, but uh, it was challenging, rewarding. The camaraderie that you felt there was was incredible. And you got to do some pretty wild things while, while, I, while I did that. Um, but I always had this lust for, for I, I also realized at the time when I was in it, it was kind of like young man sport. It was tough uh, in the sense that you're gone for eight months of the year you are away from your family, you're away from your friends, you're constantly sacrificing your days off to come back on shift early to, to support the team, or if the province needs you to fight fire. Well, it's a fire. This doesn't yeah. book a time, right? It's- yeah, it doesn't. Right. So, so you're, you're, you might have weddings or you might have any, yeah, whatever, even if you had a girlfriend, yeah. sorry, I gotta go. The boys right. need me and uh, we're going to fight fires. So that, that was my life for four years and I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, it taught me a lot of valuable leadership lessons and, and just uh, lessons in yeah. grinding it out and, and living in inhospitable um, terrain and, and climate and everything. So yeah, you, you work uh, 14 hours on a fire line and you go and sleep in a tent at the end of the night and you don't shower for a week. You start to learn a lot about yourself and a lot about people around you. I'm sure a lot about a lot of things. Around oh my you. gosh. Yeah. Oh so were you gosh. involved like in the Fort Mac fires or any like yeah. at that, that time? Is uh, that... Sorry, Fort Mac, Fort Mac was the very first year that uh, we started our company. So I wasn't right. fighting fire that year. Um, but I was, I was a part of Zam. Uh, that, that was the year before, I think that was year or two prior. It didn't matter every year. This is the only year it seems to have been relatively quiet in yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, well, and, you know, I mean, we're almost out, I hope. Well, and there are still a lot of fires. It's just in Alberta, you don't really hear about them down south. It's more when it when it's up north, you hear, hear right. about them. Yeah, so we fought uh, a lot of big fires and had a, a lot of good times over the years. But I always had this this knack um, that I need to do something more with my life. I need to kind of almost create a legacy, and I need to build something. I need to create something. Um, I, and I remember every time I'd come back home. I would get off tour uh, from fighting wildfires and you'd have to re re integrate yourself with society because you had, you said a lot of bad things and you, you had a lot of slang and it, so, so it would take a couple of days, but every time I'd kind of meet some friends or it'd go out and we'd come back to Calgary and, or even Edmonton and, and we'd have go to these coffee shops and we'd have coffee and, and uh, growing up in Calgary my whole life, something I always loved about it was how wild it felt. And, and it had this, this kind of cowboy blue collar culture to it that people were friends. It kind of had this small town uh, vibe to it. Um, we, we call Calgary like the biggest small town really. Um, but now it's at a whole different level. Right. <clears throat> but I, I felt that kind of slipping away ever. And, and, and I started to notice it a lot in, in like the culture of, of coffee uh, every coffee shop that we go into was starting to become more pretentious, more uh, uh, whitewashed, very Seattle, Portland, Toronto, Vancouver esque. Right. It didn't right. have it didn't have the life and the feel that Calgary um, represented in my mind. And so, I, the the idea started percolating, we'll say, uh, where I was trying to think of a way that 
how could you create a coffee company that ultimately would marry itself with the outdoors so you could showcase the experiences the hardship the fun the the emotion uh around camping or hiking or, or doing any of that and and that actually all came to me on uh an elk hunting trip with uh my good buddy mark muller um we were on an elk hunting trip this is in 2014 <clears throat> It was in the fall. It was actually my last semester of university and I only had three options. So I didn't, and I didn't need to go to any of my classes. I was in like love class. I saved all the best for last. And so I was like, ah, this is perfect. I can just hunt and spend my time in the outdoors for the host a little yeah, fall. Yeah. yeah. And, and kind of uh, really think about this, um, this idea. So we were, we were out hunting and, and we get back. We had an amazing morning. We we're, we we're hunting elk that morning. Uh, we get on this big herd and we were with our bow and arrow and we we're about 40 yards from, from this elk and Mark got too nervous. He was shaking like a leaf. He wasn't able to shoot this, this, this elk. And, and anyways, we could get back to our, our little campsite after, and we make up some coffee and we percolate it the old school way. And, um, and I remember just sitting there and I was like, man, this feeling is incredible. Like we just had an amazing morning, got to experience the outdoors. We're having coffee. We're just shooting the shit. I was like, why can this experience not exist in our city? Like, and how, if, if it could, how do we make that happen? Right. And uh, so we joked about calling it Calgary Cowboy Coffee Company for the, for the very uh, first, first uh, just kind of joke around about it. Mark had a full-time job and everything. And, and so uh, we joked about that, that when was that? That was in September. And uh, it wasn't until I brought it up again in, uh, I think it was late October with my, with my buddy, Mike, I was on another hunting trip. It was actually Mike's first hunting trip. I had brought him up North, uh, to the Wilmore and that's near Jasper, Jasper right. National Park. It's just mm -hmm. on the, the East side of it. And we're in the Wilmore wilderness and we didn't see a whole lot, <laughs> but, uh, so we had more time to drink whiskey than we did uh hunting and i kind of pitched my group of buddies i said hey i've got this idea i'm thinking uh what do you think and and uh mike was one of the guys he's like i absolutely love that um so we hunted the rest of the trip kind of mold over it and uh it wasn't until uh, a little bit later that winter when i called mike up because he was he gotten out of a bad relationship and he was ski bumming it in Fernie. He wanted to be a ski bum. It was on his bucket list and he wanted to work in Fernie and just shred all the time. Unfortunate part is it, it rained most that winter. So <laughs> poor oh, guy, but poor guy. Um, so I just called him up out of the blue one day and I, I, uh, I met Mike in university and we both were presidents of our own club. So, uh, and we used to collaborate all the time together. So I'd worked already with Mike. We became good buddies mm -hmm. and I knew he wasn't up to anything. And I said, Hey, Mike, I have this, you know, that idea I talked to you about on the hunting trip. What, what, what do you think about uh, making it a reality? Would you, would you be able to give up a few years here and, and go hard at it and, and partner with me on this endeavor? And he said, yeah. So I was pretty shocked. And, and I went down quite a few times to Fernie, gave him some green beans, kind of showed him how to roast. And we had talked out all the intricacies at the time. And, and that's kind of how uh, Calgary Heritage really ultimately uh started up uh, oh, that's pretty cool sorry i know it's a lot a lot of no uh, that's okay that's, that's really yeah, cool yeah. <clears throat> where did you did you so when you were thinking about this did you have you know because uh, like i i maybe i'm the best example is like i love coffee right but i know jack all about roasting <laughs> <laughs> i just know when i'm drinking it i know i know what's good and what's not good um, and I'm really up to date on all the foo foo rays to, to make coffee, but did you have roasting in your background or is this just something that you kind of went, I freaking love this. I got to figure this out. Well, I was the head baker at Tim Hortons when I was 13. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. the Tim Hortons and coffee necessarily <laughs> connect as well as. No, just I, I just say, listen, <laughs> you and I share some of that background because at 15, I, I used to dust all the, I used to do all the donuts in the back of Tim Hortons as well. And oh, nice. I, I felt like I learned, yeah, you know, I leveraged 15. that 
knowledge yeah. for way more than <laughs> yeah so when we were 15 that. there was no tim hortons in british columbia we didn't have a tim yeah. hortons so i uh, we didn't even know what a tim oh, well, hortons was that's, outside of a hockey player yeah, yeah. um yeah. honestly i had no no experience at all i think it's kind of like like you guys with, with with your podcast when you first started yeah. did you have a ton yeah. of experience with your podcast no, no. I a little bit none yeah yes yeah. so i didn't know what a podcast was yeah and i had and, a little but but not that much <laughs> i think i think with roasting coffee it's kind of like being a dj you don't know until you get into it and then right. you start to get better and it's just trial through error ultimately yeah um, but you didn't start with like, the roasting like the roasting wasn't the kicker for you you were you were you were trying to capture yeah. the, the coffee culture in, in a yeah. sense is what my understanding right. what i heard right that's yeah. where you're at so you're thinking, you know, and trust me, if you want to live in the city of pretension and coffee, you, you move here. <laughs> yeah. you know, just Cal, you, you guys, please, you, you guys understand a chance against this city. Totally. If you want yeah. to see pretentious coffee, this is the city. Oh, and, and be serious. Uh, yeah, it is. It is for sure. We're even like Seattle look, we make Seattle look great. I mean, this is, <laughs> this, I mean, this is really sad of what we've done, but so you're trying to capture this culture. But you, so, it's still a quantum leap, right? Because most of us drink, I mean, yeah. I have two coffee companies and I did own a coffee bar. Yeah. So I get, I love, I'm like Phil, I love coffee. I, I love like all day, every day. That's, I love coffee. I love, I love the idea of coffee and not even because of the, the warmth and, and the joy I drink, uh, drinking it. It's really the conceptual idea of coffee. Mm -hmm. Wars were started over coffee. Wars were stopped over coffee. Relationships start and stop over coffee. Um, the great ideas of the world start in coffee bars. And you know what I mean? It's coffee is just sort of that. Yeah. That thing. It's the thing. That yeah. legal drug. Yeah, it is, yeah. but it's, it's, yeah. it, and it's, and it's not even the coffee sometimes like it's the shop and it's the, I don't it's know what it experience. is. It's, it's, the, it's the experience of it. Right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a really tough thing yeah. to bottle and or bag. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what I mean? So that's our IP because there's no IP to coffee. At the end of the day, everybody no. can do it. Everybody can can work. Well, beans on it. a bean is a bean. You roast it all the same way. You roast higher temperature, lower temperature. Yeah. Leave some oil and take some oil out. What I mean, yeah, but it's still. Yeah, at the end of the day, really, what, was, what we were trying to do was how do we create this brand that anchors around coffee that can marry the outdoors with coffee so did and you start with the coffee though jamie then so what were you thinking more of trying to get a coffee establishing up and running have a coffee that felt like it belonged there and it worked that or were you trying to get a coffee made that would try to evoke these those emotions because one's a lot more difficult than the other we were trying to get a coffee made that would evoke those emotions. That's that's really tough though, right? Because yeah. it's a bag on the shelf and coffee. I hate to say it, I, mean, I'm, I live and breathe it. It's a commodity. You're right. You're right. How do you how do you how do you get that in a you know? I, so I pick up a bag. How do I how do I how do I feel that? How do I? Yeah, and I'll, eating I'll you is I, different. Like we saw on the can, show, it's different. Hopefully, I can take you down that path. Um, Lighter up, baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just to to kind of go back in. Um, that emotion, what that is and what that experience is. Um, so when I was a little kid, uh, my dad would take me camping all the time and we would yeah. be in our little tent trailer and I would be sleeping on the side. And I remember him, he'd wake up every morning at about 6 a.m. and he would percolate up a pot of coffee. I didn't drink coffee at the time, but that smell, the aroma, the nostalgia, the feeling of, of us being out there, him waking up, him doing that. It just, it's locked in my mind. It's no different than the smell of bug spray. The smell of bug spray tells yeah, me it's you of summer. June, it's summer. Yeah, it's yeah for summer, camping, right? So when I see a percolator <clears throat> going away and I, or I smell coffee, that's yeah. what I see. I see my childhood kind of flash back. So I had thought, how can I create a product and an experience that elicits that emotional reaction out of my customers on the store shelf? So when you see it, it reminds you of the best times of your life, which is a very daunting task Huge. for sure. Yeah, that's tough. And, it's and the way tough. it's, and the way it started initially was we created, we were roasting out of Mike's mom's garage, these little batches of coffee. And we would start it. We started as an e-commerce platform. We had realized early on and in, in, in early 2015 that 
there is no way that we could go to a bank or find an investor or anything that they would give us capital to start up a coffee shop to create this experience. Um, so we were like, well, the next best thing is Shopify, Squarespace. Those guys were all kind of coming online. Yeah. So they had easy templated <clears throat> platforms that we could create a beautiful website. Um, and we knew that we had the grit and determination. So we started there where we created our, our, our online website that showcased a lot of those pictures, a lot of that feeling, a lot of that emotion. And then we started to tie that in with our coffee. Did we have it right off the bat? Absolutely not. And this has been a work in progress for seven years now. And I feel like now is where we're actually starting to really hit the nail on the head with, with our, our, our marketing and, and everything. But it started as just a craft bag with Calgary Heritage Roasting Company. Um, but it was all of the ancillary stuff that came in with that, that bag of coffee, all the pictures you saw, all of our Instagram presence, mm -hmm. all, all of our handwritten notes. Um, we've really tailored our marketing from the beginning to be, hey, take this coffee. Hopefully it makes you think of the outdoors or take it with you while you're out, out in the outdoors. Because right. ultimately we want to be a company that is synonymous with going camping, going hiking. Right experiencing the outdoors and that's kind of how we we originally started uh throughout the process um and it took a took a, it takes a long time before you're able to gain enough scale and 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 purchasing power to hit minimums of, of bag purchasing where right. you can actually finally make a fully customized bag that fits your brand and your image and 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 your give back socially all that kind of stuff so <clears throat> wow. you're um the burnt timber bag i think is the one that kind of like for me like i don't know if that's what you see but when i saw the burnt timber bag is kind of when i went i get it i get <laughs> I, get, I get what he's trying to do yeah. um yeah yeah that's kind of the like so you know for listeners if you go on the site <clears throat> under bags the burnt timber bag is it's a customized bag right like it's it's got a uh, burnt timber on it and it's got the whole outdoors with the sun in the back i think it's a sun or a sunset in the background the whole bit right and that kind of made me go oh i understand yeah. what he's after so, yeah. so that that yeah. that bag right there really ties back to uh our wildfire days and okay. um both mike and i were wildland firefighters but burnt timber is that's just the sun ultimately coming through a burnt out forest yeah. um and yeah. you used to see that on the fire line a lot and a lot of people in i would say even the whole pacific northwest we're very familiar with wildfires and what a burnt out forest looks like and yeah and that, that eerie feeling when you're walking through one but mm. um we yes yeah, so in 20 i think what, what year was it 2019 we we came out with we had launched initially through ca okay. we had started off and we decided to go down the retail route from the very beginning, we decided to go down the retail route. We wanted to get into grocery stores and we wanted to start competing with Kicking Horse. And I, we saw that there is a very um, small market there where, where there was a large market where there was only one player ultimately in there. There was Starbucks and then there was a couple other Lavazas and then there was Kicking Horse in this weird gray space. Mm -hmm. And then there were maybe a couple mom and pop roasteries that were kicking below that in local hyper localized shops. And it, it's actually been in, in those shops a lot longer in BC than it has been in Alberta. Oh, yeah. So we haven't seen that in Alberta for a lot longer. So really our idea was how can we push this? And it, our, our idea of pushing the outdoors across Canada, everybody can relate with the outdoors. Every Canadian can, every North American can. So <clears throat> We didn't feel like it was too far fetched and, and we were really wanted to start carving ourselves uh, into that shelf space around kicking horse. So, but what we had realized in, I think it was in 2017 or 2018 when we were at CHFA was people from around Canada don't ultimately like the name Calgary in on their bag, uh, especially from BC. BC is very proud of their coffee culture and BC is very proud of uh, yeah. the micro roasteries. So us trying to get into grocery store shelves and cut in and sell our, our product as Calgary on the name, we realized soon after that that was never going to work. Mm -hmm. So 
when we launched our second <clears throat> our second uh, line of bags, which is our Canadian SKU set, which is Canadian Heritage Roasting Company, um, that was very centralized around uh, the outdoors. So we have uh, grizzly bear, we have bison, mm -hmm. we have burnt timber, and we have salmon run. Um, and we really wanted to make it feel like a piece of art. Um, and actually it is art. Uh, we partnered with uh, a guy named Mike Sidoric, and he is a prominent artist in Calgary. He, he sets up at the Calgary Stampede exhibition every year for his, his art gallery. And he, he commissioned all the, the artwork on every, every bag of ours. And we also collaborated and we show his name on all of our bags. So anybody who is buying our coffee can see who the artist is and maybe, maybe they'll pick up his painting or, or become familiar with him. Um, so we commissioned him and we really want to give this, this, this hyper artistic, uh, colorful and just outdoors inspired feeling towards our, our coffee bags. And we feel like we, we really did a good job with it. I love it. I love the well, look of it. Definitely screams yeah. outdoors. I, I just want to say that Torontonian, yeah. I'm in Toronto, but Torontonians would take Calgary coffee easy. <laughs> we'd we'd probably take I, I, it I'm above Vancouver a Vancouver and based coffee because they're all hoity-toity yeah. over there. So, <laughs> but that's thing I told you it's a it's a it's a highly pretentious city for coffee. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. it's just yeah, yeah. it was yeah, what it is. is, and it's not it that is. we've even done a great job with it, right? We've got roasts in the city that are fucking disgusting. We've gone to an yeah. acidic coffee taste, yeah. which I have no idea where that came from or why that even exists. I think yeah, it was I, just <clears throat> very very polarizing at that time. Um, coffee was finally just coming out of like the the stone ages and literally yeah and people realize oh or these roasters these micro roasters realize oh hey wow we can get these coffees that taste like jam and strawberries and sour patch kids and which they could it just was never a common thing in north america but why north america, why why would you just cause <clears> because because it's like wine Right. You can have a you can have a, a cab sav or an amarone, or you can have a you can get up lighter, you can go into a Pinot Noir, you can go whatever, right? There's a spectrum of coffee, but for some reason this third wave really went full bore on the sour floral mm, acidic yes. coffee. Damned it. Yeah. So we every ounce decided, of my bean. so when we were starting, we said, because I come back and I'd be like, this coffee is terrible. Like my stomach hurts. You can't drink it. No. And I remember, yeah, I, I, I was in like diner. I forget where I was diner deluxe, I think in Calgary. And I like drank the coffee there and I was like, Holy geez, Louise, like what is going on here? Like, I don't even want to finish this and you're dumping so much cream in it. So we decided, okay, well, if we're going to get into the coffee industry, we're going to do, let's find third wave, high quality coffee that grades over 82, but let's do it on the savory side. And we were kind of the first ones to really start to hone in on that. So that's kind of Can one. Can you explain the 82? Because I don't, I don't know. What, what's yeah. like grades 82? Yes. Yeah. So there's, there's a, something called Q grading in coffee. And it's, it's okay. kind of like, it's kind of like a wine sommelier, uh, but you're a Q grader for the quality of your coffee. And it comes down to um, obviously the quality of the bean, uh, the size of the bean. So are, are you, do you have consistency in your sizing and, and, and that comes through, through your grading process. Mm -hmm. um, then it's your finish and um, the drying methods and the, ultimately how many imperfections are on your X amount of beans within, uh, within, a, within a, a number of, of beans, you're allowed mm -hmm. to have this many imperfections and then they grade it uh, once they, once they roast it and brew it. And then you get, um, uh, and then you get X amount, then you get a certain flavor to it. So then these cuppers, they'll Q grade it and then they'll mark it uh, over between zero and a hundred. So anything over 82 um, is typically considered a uh, grade A coffee or third wave. Right. So most third wave roasters will be buying the top, top tier coffees and then roasting them. But what it wasn't happening at the time is people weren't buying the top tier savory coffees. They were only buying the top tier floral acidic sour coffees. And that was all the rage. And we decided, hey, if we're going to be this company that's going to try and push 
everyday people into better quality coffee and better quality and like a better taste at the end of the day, why wouldn't we start in the savory end? Cause that's what we like and we're going to do what we like. And then people will slowly start to become aware of what quality coffee is. And then if they want to dabble in the sour stuff, then they can start to do that from there. Right. <clears throat> okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Right, you're welcome. That's, that's very cool. Wow. Okay. So, so, so you're selling coffee, you did it online, you got to first CHFA and I think I interrupted you somewhere in the middle. So how's the retail journey going? Like, what does that look like now? Oh man, the retail journey has been a daunting one. Talk about drinking water through a fire hose. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing in that space, you are just going to get smashed yeah, and you're going to, you're going to get, mm. you're not only going to get smashed, you're just going to get turned down and turned down time and time again. Um, <clears throat> the coolest part was, I think we were quite early on the bell curve uh, with third wave coffee. So we were able to start to slowly cement ourselves in, uh, in small shops around Calgary um, and actually having our name as Calgary Heritage Roasting Company really worked to advantage in the beginning. Um, and even now, um, when people are looking for a local coffee in somewhere, they want to see the place's name on it. And if you have lampshade coffee roasters, that is an ambiguous name and nobody will know where it's yeah. from. So having Calgary in the name really helped us. Uh, we were lucky to break in our very first big break, I would say was, um, we were able to get into community natural foods, which was, nice. which was huge. Yeah, and, then, and then after that, um, it took us two years of meeting and chatting. And we finally kind of broke our way. We were the first craft coffee to be inside Calgary Co-op. So if you get Cal uh, Co-op and, and uh, wow. CNF, yeah. kind of, you're, yeah. you're good to and go in Calgary. Was, that was 24 <clears throat> stores and that opened. That's the such a big deal. And good yeah. stores. Yeah. Yeah. And huge, big movers. Honestly, yeah. it turned into one of those things. It, it took our company from zero to hero just being doing peanuts to yeah. finally keeping the lights on and, and, right. and wow everything. um and a lot of people at, at the beginning they don't realize the, the story of us like mike and i didn't pay ourselves for four years when we ran our company uh we worked side jobs as mike was a fitness trainer i was a fitness trainer he worked or mike worked for yyc cycle actually uh with andrew obrecht and I was a school bus driver for a time, so I could work in the morning and then work in the afternoon um, just to make ends meet. And we yeah. pushed our company for four years before we ever drew a salary wow. uh, from it. So it has been an, an uphill battle and, and one of the best ones. And it, and it doesn't cease to end, I'll tell you that much. But um, it is it is finally coming around here and it's we're, we're super excited. So where are you at now? So you started yeah. with Cal Co-op and... and cnf like you're i'm assuming have decent distribution in alberta yeah we yeah we've got we've got i think we sell in over 250 stores canada wide right nice. now mostly um, alberta some bc we do sell in quite a few bc where we sell in bc is we do really well in interior bc yeah the um, Kootenays, probably yeah. east and west i would assume correct yeah yeah so pretty much a lot of smaller shops around there um palm uh nature's fair Where's a couple other, um, I would have to look at my whole list. There's, there's quite a few that we sell in, um, right. Safeway Sobeys, uh, those guys were, were a part of as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but mm -hmm. they kind of trickle us in here and there. Yeah. Um, it's tougher. Yeah. They're more of like the, the buy local section. Right. Um, if you want to cut into a main store shelf, then you have to pay their listing fees. It's the listing fees and all the other bullshit. Yeah. With it. yeah. So, so you have to have the, uh, either the cash flow or you right. need to have the margin to give yeah. to them. Yeah. And are you so doing all this usually both, on your own, uh, Jamie? Yeah. Are you using a distributor? What are you doing? Yeah, so, so we <clears throat> distribute through Planet Foods. Okay, good. So we, we distribute through Planet Foods, but we, we initially distributed on our own. And it, that's kind of always one of those things that yo-yos. Yeah, bring it back in, you send it back out. Yeah, bring it back in because <laughs> you realize the salesmen that are working for these distribution companies don't give a shit. Right. And... At the end of the day, it's it's what's making their eighty percent. That's where they're going to focus Absolutely. their energy on. So, mm -hmm. as a if anybody's listening and, and you're a small business and you're like, ah, I should go get a distributor right now. No, you shouldn't. You get as many 
direct to store con uh, contacts and companies. As long as they're willing to do direct, you do direct. And then you, you hold on to those accounts, those house accounts. Um, and if, if you can't get into a store because you know they're saying, well, we only order through a distributor, maybe that's the point when you start to look at, uh, at a distributor. But you almost, you're right. And, and, but I think the other part of that too is if you have a distributor and you're wondering whether you should have one, if you've got one already, the trick, you know, what you said earlier about, look like these guys, they've got millions of SKUs and they're kind of pushing them all. That's when you've, you've got to make sure that you stay on the distributor, but not just from an enforcement standpoint, right? Like you almost need to be educating all the time. Yeah, like, absolutely. You know, or you call the more the these sales guys know about your brand. That's exactly what you do. Yeah. 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 So what we yeah, do is we really actually key. kind of step on the toes of our distributors. And a that's little. fine. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. uh, we actually, we actually do our, our, we have our own call cycles that we do weekly, um, and we'll call ahead. The problem, the, the biggest problem with that is though, is, is when you do lock down a PO, you send it to your distributor, your distributor has contacted the salesman, your salesman has to contract the store and then lock down that actual realistic PO. Right. So it, it's quite this roundabout system, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, if you're not the one that's going to call them and do the work, you're not going to get the sale. I tell that I think that's sort of the trick, and I go back to what you said: is that <clears throat> if you expect a distributor to do your job, you're delusional. Yeah, a distributor yeah. moves boxes. They're a warehouse. They're a warehouse. They move boxes, and they're, they're your AR. Yeah. So you, instead of you having a deal, trying to collect fifteen dollars from you know Jimmy John and you know spuzz them, yeah. you know, or you know Grand Prairie that you don't want to do, that's what your distributor does. But if you want to sell, sell, sell with them. Yeah. Stop stepping on their toes. If they're, if they're not going to do it, you do it. And then all you do is you tell the, even the retailer, that's the distributor. They know who it is. Put the order through. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And they, and they, they also back you up. There are some aspects that are good. Uh, Planet or uh, Planet Organic is one of them. Um, we, had, yeah. we had a decent amount of product in with Planet Organic and they went under, they went bankrupt and right. Our distributor was the one that took the took the brunt of that. You know, so there's um, yeah, there's 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 good yeah. and bad with it. But I do think yeah. you're right. I think a lot of the beginning, you've got to do your own grunt work. If you want to go right to distributor, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But you have to go open up the accounts. If you're expecting your distributor to do that, is really not their function. They Absolutely. move boxes. That's what they do, and they do it better than you're going to do it. Absolutely. You you, you never really. <laughs> Like, I guess, I guess that's the point of all of this too, is you never really brand ownership is yours at the end of it's the yours. day. It's right? yours. Like it's your brand. You, you just can't like to hand that, that over to though. anybody, even salespeople who are going to go out for you, you still own the brand, right? So exactly. you got to make sure they're talking about it the way you would talk about it, that they have as much, they will never have as much passion as you do about the brand, but yeah. they've got to <laughs> feel it. They've got to feel a good chunk of it. Right. So Absolutely. the more excited they are, the more top of mind you are. Right. So. And in a competitive market like this, I'll tell you, store managers, grocery purchasers, they want to talk to us. They don't want to talk to a salesman. No. As much as they may have the relationship mm -hmm. with the salesman, they want to see that the people behind the brand are invested in it. Mm -hmm. Right. Agree. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And then they'll talk to the sales guy all day because they have to order from him or her anyway. Yeah. But oh, yeah. they're not going to, you know, the, again, the salesperson is not going to bring up, yeah. oh, I, I got this product from Jamie, they're gonna, Jamie who, who cares? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess, it, so So in 2018, uh, we were fortunate enough, we, we opened up our first retail storefront in Calgary, actually, our 2019 is when we opened it, but we signed our, our lease in 2018, um, and that took us two years of tracking down this old, mm -hmm derelict building to, to finally build out. Um, and that was a very pivotal moment for our company because it was finally the time where instead of just creating the experience on the store shelf, um, doing all these demos in front of you people, finally do it. to move the product, we were finally able to make a tangible um, experience for our customers right. with our background, our coffee. So uh, yeah, in 2019, we, we launched Calgary Heritage Roasting Company down in Ramsey in Calgary. Um, in the Snowden block building. And that is, it's a brick building. It's one of the oldest buildings in Calgary is built in 1908. Um, and it was the for, uh, one of the first oil refineries in all of Western, Western Canada at that time. So they used to build, make grease, gasoline, uh, soaps, 
uh, waxes, all that kind of stuff inside of the building. Um, and fun fact, in that building in 1937, there was 100 women in there loading ammunition for World War II. So kind of kind of interesting. Wow. Kind of cool. Yeah, cool. Ton of history in the building. Yeah. And, and I really wanted to create as and keep as much of that when I built it out. So um, I, I built it out uh, with, with my team mostly, but uh, I did a lot of majority of the work. I'm, I'm super handy. So I built out the entire space and we actually pulled up the old floorboards from the basement um, and they're 120 years old. And I took all of those and I built all of our tables out of them, put them upstairs. And then we finally no way. concrete yeah. up over the dirt in the basement. So yeah, it's got a lot of character, a lot of life inside of uh, the shop and, and you feel Calgary and you feel the outdoors as soon as you walk in. So if you guys are ever in Calgary, you got to pop by. Oh yeah, do that for, for sure. sure. For yeah, sure. That'd be for awesome. Sure. I didn't, I didn't realize, um, Running a storefront has got to be a little bit different, yeah. even from all the other things that you've done. It's like oh. it's a whole different world. <laughs> oh man, let me tell you, that is the yeah. that's another like, podcast. It's like yeah, that's like the bane yeah. of my existence. It really is. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's more um, staff management. You better like staff management if yeah. you want to open up your own storefront. Well, you know what? That might be another podcast. And if you and Mike want to do that one together, I'd love totally. to because <clears throat> we're always, yeah, we, would. we get a lot of um, pre-retail uh, yeah, folks yeah. like you, like, like us, like, but we don't get a lot of retailers that'll come on. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I guess. Yeah. We are. Interesting to get the other side. Like what is, yeah. tell me how retail works. Forget the, the other side. We, how much fun is it to, you know, manage staff and we, it, it's you know it's really funny because and... last night we were talking about this um i was telling kenny <laughs> kenny and i were catching up and i was telling him uh, so i i do some work for uh, a tea company out here in in uh in toronto and he has three tea shops and so i was telling kenny about how just amazing it is that you you get you know when you're in a shop that direct access you get to a consumer, right? And like, it's like open season, right? Like when they come in, you, you see what else they're holding, you see what they're carrying, and then you you can, it's open season for picking their brain on, hey, why, why are you ordering what you're ordering? Like, can I interest you in something else? Like, you know, what other times of day would you get? Like things that you would really- Oh, you ask, you ask, really, yeah. and you start asking a million questions and, yeah. and you don't have to be yeah. bashful at all. You just, yeah. you just go out and ask them yeah. like this. People year, like to talk. Why did you yeah, buy yeah. that? Like, why did yeah, you yeah. pick that over this? And they'll yeah. look at you kind of goofy, but they'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. And like this year, we turned our coffee shop into a saloon for the 10 days of stampede. That's and, so Calgarian. Yeah. Oh, but it was, it was awesome. It was I like. Bet. It was just so different, right? No, I've there had been no coffee shop that had done that. That's and awesome. We man. have our own liquor license, so we, we decided to try that out. Oh, why not? It was a riot. Good for you. Yeah, but I guess um this so I guess over the course of our, our time, I would say our biggest break has been this last year, and it has been it has been insane, man. Getting through COVID and, and all of that. I would say on the commerce side though. It's been fantastic. People were finally drinking coffee at home and not drinking garbage coffee at their yeah, office. Thank God. And, and our sales on, on our coffee front went, went way up. Um, the storefront that went way down, but <clears throat> that's okay. You know, that's why we diversify and that's why we're diversifying as a company is so that when we hit these bumps and, and these, these valleys or ridges or whatever, and we can, we can kind of get, get over that hump. So, right. But this past year we, we took on, I took on a huge endeavor in, in 2020 and that was to, for the longest time, we had wanted to come out with our own instant coffee. Um, and I was trying to figure out a way that I could produce it in house. Everything right now is currently done. There's a couple companies that do it out of uh, the U S or Canada, uh, one out of Canada and, and a couple down in the U S and there's been a bunch that went under that started up as instant coffee companies that went under. Um, because it's so expensive, it's so difficult to do, but I had zero experience with the equipment. Uh, there's two methods that you can do. It's either freeze dried or, or, or spray dried. And I had to find, find the equipment, number one, I had to find it at a small enough capacity because they're usually made for multi-million dollar contracts sure. or, or fa uh, factories. And then I had to start to 
understand. Good thing I have a good background in chemistry uh, to, to understand what I'm what I'm working with and, and all the variables to, to square it away. But we, we were successfully able to launch our flash fuel here uh, in November of 2021. Good for you. And uh, we actually just got that into all uh, into Mex across Canada. Uh, good place to be this, this past month. Good for uh, you. Which has taken a long time. And and when people are listening, they want to know, hey, how do I get into some of these big retailers? And I don't know who the buyer is, and and I'm never going to be in there or whatever. You know what? You just reach out. <clears throat> I did something so simple. I reached out on their online platform, and if you have an inventive product and and it captures their their interests they will sure look they at will. it and if they don't then maybe you should rethink it look at right. take it back take it back to the board and look at it again and and so we're we're yeah we've we've just got in with mech and it's been it's been going gangbusters so that's been uh fantastic we've been getting great reviews with our flash fuel so and we make it all in house good for you man yeah so. i'm gonna have to try it Cause I oh, like, yeah. so I carry an air press everywhere I go. Um, cause I, I, throw that I away. really want to, but, but, uh, fire starter. Yeah. yeah like so, if you can find yeah. good instant coffee, like instant coffees, you know, again, if you go purist, you know, you would never percolate coffee. You would never drink instant coffee. Yeah. I mean, we just came from Italy and they're all over, you know, like old school mochas. Yeah. And, you know, I'm coffee. arguing with them. Listen, you can, whatever. Sure. It makes a cup of coffee, but don't, don't give me yeah. the shit that that's the best espresso yeah. on the planet. Totally. A pump is how you drive espresso. You, you yeah. push the, the water through fast and hard and hot and you rip the flavor out. You're not going to get out of a mocha. No. But there's no better coffee on the planet when you're outside than percolator. It right. might be the worst way to make a cup of coffee, but that is the best coffee in the outdoors, bar none. Oh, well, and everything it is the outdoors. Yeah. That is yeah. how you do it outdoors. Yeah. You yeah. percolate coffee. You watch it boil 50 times and you enjoy every sip of that cup. You're, you're right. Um, everything tastes better in the outdoors absolutely and that's our that's our whole shtick no i like our, it buddy our, i our, like uh, it our flash fuel um it's uh it's been incredible uh, we I don't bet. call it instant coffee because we kind of have like a little uh we have our own little shtick on it but it, it ultimately is instant coffee it's like, but whatever day. it's flash um, fuel i think it's really cool it's easy way to yeah. have a cup of coffee in the outdoors or anywhere. Anywhere. like a, a couple of things like really ring for me like one is uh you talked about how your dad used to percolate coffee in that kind of like first memory when you wake up i have the same right like as you know like i have asian parents so my when i'd stay over at my grandparents place every morning at like 6 a.m i'd hear the you know the the tinkling right like yeah. you, instant Whoop. coffee in a Whoop. cup and then and then he'd stir it and you could yeah. hear the spoon hitting the sides of the cup right so that kind of like for me, that's mine. And so the flash fuel stuff really, you know, like that rings home a little. And then the the fact that it looks like a matchbox is yeah. super cool. Like I, I just think it's um yeah, I I I think it's really cool. I get it. It's at is it at Mech like all the way across the country then? Yeah. 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 That's accessible to me. I think you should I think you should be able to find it at the Toronto one. I know that they they did they bought a, a bunch and they just yeah. started trickling it at uh, the west side and then okay. and then they're gonna okay. start bringing it fully okay. across. Well, yeah. if you, if you get a request from somebody going, can you, you send can us buy an order? Online. I I do that. I I get really annoying about those things, so I'll go and talk to the store <laughs> manager. Do do you have this? Like I I know for a fact you're supposed to have this, and they're like. Well, it's on it's on their website, so you can or you can order okay. it on their website and probably send it to their okay. to, to their store if it's not there. Okay, and I guess Canadian cool. Tire is next because they sell a ton of camping. Oh, Canadian <clears throat> Tire, we're already in the in the talks with Canadian Tire. Yeah, right it's now, a place yeah. to be, it makes sense. The Even home hardware's. Let me tell you, the Forzani Group likes to uh, they like to take their margin. Uh, most do, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Just let that one go. Just it's just it's all about retail. Yeah, absolutely. But Canadian Tire is weird though, right? Like like having franchisees like Canadian Tire is weird, right? Because they everywhere else, a lot of you know, head offices you can you can procure, right? So you kind of like uh, you know, as soon as it lands in a planogram, I'm good to go. In Canadian Tire, it's like, well, no, we can put it, we can we can pitch it to be in the planogram, but then now we got to put out a call for order. We got to wait for franchisees. 
they don't have the best relationship with their franchisees either. So yeah. there's a lot of issues know, that, but but you also have uh, Sport Check now and Marks. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. Right? And, and those change the game for you for sure. Atmosphere. For you. Like for you, it's yeah. probably atmosphere, right? Is yeah. the really big yeah. one, right? So, so they're yeah. they're the really big yeah. ones. So we're we're yeah. in talks with them right now, and I think we should be able to lock something down for 2023 here. Yeah, home hardware would be the other one. Wow, because you know what the home hardware is like in Alberta. You hit every small town in Alberta, oh, yeah. and the home hardware are, are practically across, grocers across Canada. Right, like they're, they're everywhere in every right. small town. But yeah. in the smallest towns, they're they're almost like it's less the produce and the meat. They have everything. Yeah. Like they're, that's, yeah. they're just like the one shop stop. So you the know. big, I think the biggest thing for us is it's not just getting these big fish. It's supplying them and Absolutely. not, not fucking up. Well, right? exactly. But that's how pick the right fish, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like just because the Canadian tire or well, let's say home hardware has probably like a thousand plus stores or whatever, you don't need to do them all. No. You pick, you see no. if they'll let you do the, 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 the 50 of your choice in Alberta close to home the small towns that you know you love to go to, especially if it's on the way on a hunting trip. Absolutely. Right. Cause those are the ones they crank, right. A town of 3000 people and the home hardware does as much yeah. as a grocer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's Good crazy. You, that, it's crazy that it's taken seven years, seven years to like finally hit. I feel like our coffee product is also amazing, but when you see the interest and intrigue in, in creating something that is, has a little more IP and a little, it's a little bit newer and it has a new fresh flair to it. That's not just a bag of coffee on the store shelf, especially when you've been pounding the pavement for as long as you have in that, mm-hmm. in that, in that sector, you people are like, yeah, give me that product. I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. I'm going to list that right now. You kind of sit back and you're like, this is what it must feel like to come out with like the first energy drink. Right. <laughs> I yeah, love it. I think it's great. I, I think, I think so your idea like, is cool. I think yeah. you've done a neat job. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I hope this really works really well. I mean, yeah. it looks like it's doing well. So good on you, man. Yeah. That's yeah. very cool. Very cool. Um okay, next episode we do with talk store. Yeah. 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 We'll we'll show you the link. You can you can pick a time and then and then we'll I would love we'll to do another episode. I, it's on the storefront. We, it's talk, really yeah. interesting for us because we don't yeah. get a lot of talk on that. And I think people really need to even understand that. Um, that side of yeah. we have a retailer coming on next week who, who's a, a grocer in uh, Trail Rosland, right where I grew up. Yep. Um is coming on. It'd be great to have a coffee like shop come on. Seriously, yeah. because I don't yeah. I think people lose sight, they get so stuck in their own worlds and they forget, well, this has to translate in the next world. You're right. And how does that work? So if you don't mind taking us through the story, pick a time. Totally. And, and, and we were, we were lucky, I think, when we did it, because we, we ended up actually putting a roastery inside of it. So oh, yeah. Super we, cool. we made sure before we opened up the cafe yeah. portion that we were able to cover everything right. with just our coffee yeah. sales before we even looked yeah. at. So our, we were in a unique situation where our coffee shop was the cherry on top. So whatever we made on top of that just went to help help right. our push our retail sales. And if anything, it's also good marketing, right? <clears throat> mm-hmm. You yeah. want to experience it, now you get it. Hopefully you grab a whole bunch of new people coming on to it. That's exactly it. Jamie, good for you. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for coming on. This this is no, uh, exciting. It. Thank you. We're, we're excited for you and uh, we'll we'll talk to you soon again uh, about the storefronts as well we'll send you a link to book a time i, I really yeah, want to yeah, yeah. front shop i think it'd be yeah. fun cool sounds good kenny and phil thank you guys very much for for your time today hopefully, no thank uh, you for the time your listeners awesome. learned a few <laughs> things you. and yeah yeah sounds good okay. all right okay. take, care. take care of yourself phil hang on we'll talk yeah uh, jamie have a great day see you James. Right, again man oh, bye bye ciao ciao <clears throat> hey that was cool buddy it's coffee yeah how can coffee not be cool I know everything about coffee is cool. Come on. No, I just like, I like the story. I like, I like the way they're trying to do it. Cause it's, it's, uh, it's funny. We, we were talking about this even in, in Italy or I think probably Emilia and I, because I get really snobby, right? Because, you know, they're all, oh, the mocha is the best way to make an espresso. And you think, no, it's not even close to the best way to make an espresso. It might be uh, sentimentally the best yeah. way to make an espresso. I'm not going to argue yeah. that, but it is definitively not the best way to make an espresso. Sorry, yeah, yeah. you just cannot push enough pressure through that coffee to extract what you want out of the out of coffee which a pump does having said that nothing like the sound of it spitting and you have to get up to turn the heat off you know what i mean like 
and a percolator. Like if you're camping or outdoors, I, it's the shittiest way to make coffee, to boil coffee 50,000 times over and over. Yeah. But I shit you not, that is the best coffee on the planet. No, it's great. Camping. Really? It's, there's nothing great. like it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, but it I is, agree. it's more of, it's more the, uh, yeah. the evoking of the sentimentality of, 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 a, of a situation or a place. I, I, I'm good on them. I think, I think it's a neat yeah. idea. I, I think it's a really neat <laughs> idea. I think it's tough. I, yeah. But I, I think. Yeah, uh, they're, they're not, it's not an easy climb. Like there's, nah, you know, kind of one. like better ways to do things but yeah it's a tough doing one. what they love right like and he's, that's, and that's he's, all that counts. you know what's what's come for him has yeah. come to fruition well and they're making money at it too so it's good yeah. i mean it's not like yeah. they're it's not like you know they're they're following their passion you know yeah you know, i've had discussions on that where you follow passion yeah. that leads to nowhere and yeah. they're actually making a living at it and yeah. doing what they love i mean god bless yeah. them man what a great way to go through life i love it i love it <clears throat> awesome sir hey buddy boy that's it i gotta that's start it. this uh, day yeah, me and I too, think I'm on too. with you in a couple hours. So I think so. Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. <laughs>